What's up, guys? I'm hanging out with my homie Rupert, Crypto Rupert. You might have seen him. I'm Kyle Chasse, hanging out with some of our friends today, Jedediah Taylor from Crypto Coin Traders. We got Carl from the Moon and Chris from MM Crypto. We'll be talking about the uh, global state of emergency right now. We're talking about the Fed printing tons and tons of money. We'll be talking about how you can protect yourself in something uh, in this kind of situation. So check it out. Okay, so same panel again. Uh, replacing Didi with uh, Jedediah. Uh, you guys want to just give a quick intro? Jedediah, go ahead. Uh, Jedediah Taylor, been in the space since uh, 2016, been watching the space since 2014. Been involved in a number of projects, uh, both from an operational perspective as well as an advisory perspective. Uh, public speaker, advisor, influencer, kind of all the above. So, trader, uh, kind of do it all. Ooh, Chris? I'm Chris from MM Crypto. It's nice to be here. Um, you probably know me from our MM Crypto channel on YouTube. Just type in MM Crypto and you'll find it. We talk about Bitcoin, the economics, the financial crisis, which is right now happening, um, and macroeconomic stuff every day on our channel. We have a German channel, English channel, Telegram community, and you can meet me at conferences where I'm speaking um, on stage as a keynote speaker. And yeah, that's most important uh, things to know. Carl? Yeah, I'm um, a uh, so-called crypto YouTuber, making one video every day on YouTube about Bitcoin. And I'm also a public speaker, speaking about Bitcoin, teaching people about the um, the uh, flaws of the financial system and how Bitcoin is a uh, very good alternative to the current system. That's very good. Uh, I'm Kyle. I've been in crypto since 2012. And uh, yeah, I've done a bunch of stuff, built different projects. Uh, also speak and moderate panels and now we're building some cool stuff here on Copen Yang and for changes as well. Uh, yeah, let's jump into it. Uh, so speaking about financial crisis, um, so is Corona to blame or was it something else? Anyone can I jump in? I think Corona is, is the trigger for what was inevitable anyways. So I think without Corona, all of this um, crashes in the financial markets, all the crises they would have happened also but um, maybe just a few months later so this come, came at the exact perfect time even though it's of course a horrible thing but for all the elites it's a very nice and convenient thing to blame everything on um, and it was certainly the trigger but it was not the reason for everything happening so um, the reason is of course the, the central banks printing money since like 50 years like crazy they in 2008 it escalated and um, yeah putting cheap money into the system, which um, the amount of, of, of currency in circulation is, is the, the growth is much higher than the economic growth and this certainly leads to massive overvaluations on the financial markets and um, this, this it's, it's a huge bubble which inevitably had to burst and this was just like a, a nail in the coffin but it was already dead. I would say that it's, uh, yeah, not only was it the nail, uh, the, the nail that popped the bubble but also um, it's making it worse. So the the financial crisis it was inevitable and it is still inevitable and it the bubble has to deflate. Um, but it's like Corona. It's like kicking someone who's already lying down. So it's it's um, actually making it even even worse, making it uh, quicker and more dramatic. I think that without Corona it could still happen, but maybe we wouldn't see this uh, dramatic short term. Um, um, escalation of the, the stock market crash. Couldn't agree more. It's like there's these little fires starting to burn and Corona just poured a bunch of gasoline on it yeah. and made it kind of explode. Yeah. Um, and the unemployment rates, things that we're seeing right now in the short term, like uh, Chris and Carl both said, have, have gone further and quicker than they would have without it. But 100% this was inevitable and uh, just kind of the catalyst. Cool. I I'm a little bit confused. Um, you know, I. I thought that the, the rapid printing of money was what led to inflation. However, I, I hear different people on different media channels talking about like a deflationary uh, economy that we're going through. So maybe what, any of you guys can maybe shed some clarity on that? Well, when when stock markets correct, that is deflationary. When stock markets go up in price, that's inflationary. And we have seen big inflation um, in stocks, real estate, and basically most assets around the world. 
Um, so what we're seeing now is a deflationary event where all of the credit that was um, out in the world is now um, shrinking. So banks they create money from from lending out um, credit, and this credit uh, is used as money in the system. And um, and when when credit shrinks, that's when we see this deflation. And and we're seeing it right now in. Um, in stocks and we'll probably see this continue to real estate. I think real estate hasn't really corrected yet. I think that that is to come. Um, I usually uh, compare what we see now with um, the Great Depression and the stock market crash of 1929. And uh, back then the stock market uh, crashed approximately 90% over the following years after the, the initial stages of the crisis. And I think it's very possible that we will see something uh, like that or even worse in stocks, but even real estate and maybe most of the assets around the world because there is so much debt around the world, there has been so much credit, so much debt that um, sadly someone has to be punished for, for all of this debt and it's uh, sadly that the general public who has taken on all of this debt. And call it stupidity or manipulation by the, the, the media or whatever. Um, I mean, of course it's not good to take on huge amounts of loans, but also uh, the central banks and the governments, they have created incentive for people to, to yeah. loan money by lowering interest rates and making it cheap. And also it's this herd mentality where if your neighbor borrows uh, currency to buy a car and to buy a home, then why shouldn't you also do it? Because um, also the more people that do borrow currency to, to buy houses, the more the housing prices go up and you're basically left behind if you, if you don't do what everyone else is doing. Um, so for a very long time it has been uh, rewarded. You've been rewarded by uh, taking more debt than you're supposed to do and, and speculating in, in real estate. And you should actually, this should be a bad thing. You should, you should lose money and you should get punished. Uh, but the majority has been doing it for a long time and the more people that do it, the more people get rewarded for it. And I think that what we're going to see now is this final punishment for this uh, this global stupidity and the global uh, um, this global uh, it's trend like of taking on. Right? Yeah, I mean it's it's just not healthy to take on debts like this to speculate in in markets like real estate and stocks. And it's not only individuals; also corporations have been taking on huge amounts of debt to to. Uh, uh, to speculate and to sh buy back shares and all of this. But how about the um, the monetary supply or the, the currencies? Yeah. What's going on with that right now? So, so when we're talking about deflation and inflation, there are two different ways of, of defining that. Um, you could talk about de deflation and inflation and price deflation and inflation, which is tied to the CPI, but the CPI is not really reflecting the reality what's because the CPI? it's the consumer price index where one central authority decides on what is going into that basket and it doesn't reflect reality usually like we had like a two percent um, inflation price inflation and in fact it was a six to eight percent because real estate and all of that is not taking into that basket as it should be what do you think um, the the actual percentage is right now six, oh my, i mean in that exact moment it's yeah. very hard to say because it's measured over over years like yeah um now we have like one, one one month of probably price deflation. However, the real numbers you should take into consideration is the expansion and contraction of the currency supply in the world. So when when we have the central banks expanding the money, the, or the, the currency in circulation, then this is what I would call the inflation and the prices follow that with the delay. So um, that is actually inflation and what they should actually do while we had a massive bull run during the last I don't know, eight, ten, ten years or so, they should have contracted the money supply and then in bad times they would have breathe, they would have room to grow and then they can expand the money supply again. But if you look at the monetary base within the last, since, since the financial crisis 2008 was only expanding and there was no contraction going on whatsoever. So right now the only thing they can do is just print more, print more, lower the interest rates to zero and then inevitably even to minus and um, then within that deflation we have a huge expansion of the mon monetary supply and i think once this crisis is over and people start spending money again this is also when all of that will leverage into the prices and we will not only see the 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 mon currency expansion going more wild we will also see prices follow drastically 
and this is what will lead to a also hyperinflation in terms of prices whereas we are already see a very big inflation in terms of monetary uh, currency expansion and as that expands that's why you hear the term bubble a lot is it's like you know it's expanding it's expanding it's expanding until eventually it pops right like if you take a balloon and you start to blow it up it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it's been, it essentially it pops and that's when we talk about uh coronavirus being the kind of pin that that popped that bubble uh going back to carl's point in relation to real estate and that being likely soon to follow is i mean at the end of the day people have to pay mortgage they have to pay rent they have to do things like this and you have unemployment rates increasing and you're taking away people's ability to actually make those payments it's it's absolutely inevitable in my mind we'll see more defaults than we've seen i, I think it'll surpass what happened in 2008 because this is a more severe situation they kind of crazy. just compounded what would happen in 2008 by what chris was saying having that continual inflation and it hasn't slowed down rather than in the good times pulling back and sucking air out of the balloon they're just pushing more air into the balloon so it compounds as it gets worse and worse and uh real estate will be shortly to follow as yeah. people default more and more with their inability to pay. do you think that uh do you think that the federal governments are handling the situation the proper way right now, or, you know, I, I mean, how could it be done better? I mean, <laughs> given the the things they can do, they're just pulling all the triggers they can. They just have not much more room of, of actions. They, they have the interest rate. They have um, they can they can buy bonds, treasuries, and stocks on the secondary market, and that's basically all they can do. This is all what they can do right now, but um, it will not save us from that. So that's why we are always saying it's inevitable because there's no way to get out of this. Yeah, Rather the, than the just proper, letting everything crash the, down. The proper way to handle it is more preventative than reactive. And right now they're in a state that it's gotten so bad they can do nothing but react to it. Um, the proper way to handle it is more preventative, is when the economy starts doing well, make it more healthy by deflating what has been previously inflated. And now it's past the point of no return where it's completely reactive and there's nothing else they can go against. No. Yeah, I mean, central banks, they can actually only do two things. They can man manipulate interest rates and they can print money. Uh, and so far they have been printing a lot of money and they have manipulating the interest rates. But what they also can do in terms of printing money is that they can expand the type of assets that they buy with this newly printed money and that's what we've already seen by um, seeing them start buying corporate debt and we will probably soon see them starting to buy stocks also directly from the open market where they print a bunch of currency and goes out and just buys Apple and buys Facebook and buys Boeing or whatever uh, comes to mind and um, that is that would be an extraordinary environment but we've already seen extraordinary things happen that were totally unexpected a few years ago even a few months ago so uh, we should actually expect the unexpected and even 0% interest rates which we're, which we're seeing now in the US that would have been very very hard to um, predict back just two months ago people did not expect that but now we see 0% and I've always been saying that I think that we're going to see them go negative just like we've seen in a handful of other countries uh, for the past few years so we already know that central banks um, they, they, they can go negative uh, the only question is what are the consequences and I think that that would just lead to massive hyperinflation eventually when people are so incentivized to take on debt that they even get paid to take debt. Do you guys, uh, you guys have an estimated timeline more or less of uh, when this, um, this kind of artificial propping up of the system might collapse? There's one thing, like, people usually say that whatever you do in the, in the economy, like, if you manipulate interest rates today, or print currency today, the effects will come, like, two years from now. Um, so, whatever happens today, the real true effects will, will or should come uh, with a lagging delay. So, so you think that, what, two more years of a, of a, good, a good economy? No, I think that we will see uh, one or two years of massive deflation. Also, there's a big difference between the economy and the financial market. So the economy can go down while the financial markets are going up yeah. because it's just a derivative of the of the economy and the people are rational. So maybe we see like the, the financial markets that kept bouncing or whatever, but, but, but the economy will still go down. 
However, I think um, the that second that thing to what see that that's happening right now. I mean, we're, we're seeing the you know the financial market surviving and, and actually you know like it's pretty volatile, yeah. but we're not. But they haven't crashed yet. Who knows? Who knows? Let's see what what happens. We had it already a big bounce. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I wanted to add one thing. Like maybe it's one or two years. But the second thing we should keep in mind is whenever like the majority is suffering. So when we see like the majority of 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 real estate um, debts default and um, like really the majority of people suffering at this I think this could be a turning point because um, yeah li like you already said before the majority they cannot um, they cannot succeed so whenever this happens this could be also a turning point and um, yeah there's yeah. one interesting point I think because there's one thing in markets like the the majority is always wrong that's like uh, a general thing and so far we've seen the majority being right for like maybe even decades people just speculating on real estate just taking on massive amounts of debt and everyone has been rewarded for it while it, it is actually complete stupidity to to uh, to take on this massive amount of leverage and going in with like uh, more debt than you you should be able to take and just put it into real estate it's just like i mean no one would uh, borrow two million dollars and, and buy buy a stock and if that was all you had, like if, let's say you have 200,000 and you borrow um, 2 million from that and you wouldn't buy a stock with that if that was everything you own because the risk is crazy. But this has been normalized in the real estate market. People do that stuff. It's normal. It's even uh, encouraged. Um, and that's what, that's what I'm saying. I think this is going to be extremely... Um, people will be punished for that. So let's talk about... There's been, uh, there's been some talks about bailouts happening right now, right? And we had this other bailouts of the banks in 2008, uh, but now we've got different types of bailouts going on, right? You guys know anything about that? Yeah, they, uh, I think the recent bill they just passed was approval of two trillion dollars to be put into, uh, into the economy. And the sad part is, is that it's kind of the same old, same old that's ar that it's already happened. They're taking a little over five hundred billion dollars and they're giving that actual to the to the actual citizens. But they've also bookmarked another upwards of one trillion to go to businesses, and I think it's uh, or yeah one trillion, and then it's five hundred billion of that is going to major corporations, which is just bailing out. I've even heard talks of bailing out cruise lines and things like this, which aren't even incorporated in the United States and are avoiding paying U.S. taxes. Now the U.S. government's coming to kind of bail them out. So I think we're going to see a lot of the same old, same old. Is it's just an excuse to keep the club together and for all the big boys to not have to pay the price that the little people have to pay. It's actually, I don't understand the, the, the 500 billion to the citizens because uh, I think that math works out to something like, um, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred dollars per person or something. 1,200 I believe. I think it's much less than still that. not a lot if you compare the if you compare the corporates with the with the citizens it's like it's corporates are getting I mean the citizens are getting one thousand two hundred per person and if you if you if you break down what the corporates are getting per citizen that's like eighteen k so they get like fifteen times more than than the citizens and also coming back to the bailouts I think it creates a big moral hazard if you if you bail out big companies or banks like in 2018 and now uh, eight and right now the, the corporates because if you bail it out in the next crisis everyone knows we get bailed out because we are too big to fail and that creates yeah. more moral hazard and yeah. more bad acting I, but I don't understand so so some of the, the companies have been discussed about bailing out are things like Hilton and the cruise lines but these guys make billions of dollars of profit every year so I mean Corona has been going on for a and we've only had really serious lockdowns for maybe a month now. Yeah, but if you take Boeing for an example, I saw some but data my, but, that they have. But my question is, hold on. My question is, if they're making so much profit every year, and they don't have revenue for one or two months, why do they need to be bailed out? That's it. They've been they've been doing uh, bad stuff. They've been they've been, for example, taking a lot of the the revenue a lot of the profits to buy buying back shares for example they've been buying back shares for billions and billions of dollars i don't remember the exact number but i i think yeah but boeing they have been buying back shares for a huge amount of money since 2008 and if they didn't do that and saved this money for a rainy day like now then they would have been better off but they didn't uh, they they were actually um, stupid 
but this is it's not productive to buy back shares because you're not increasing productivity you're not increasing value in the company you only prop up the value of the stock um, so you're not you're not creating value so this money should have been used for a rainy day but this is the thing everyone is doing the same corporations and individuals people are not saving they have, they've just been spending and spending and spending and uh, speculating and speculating no one is saving for a rainy day everyone is living paycheck to paycheck and uh, that's why the the economy is so fragile now that just a small little deflationary um, trigger like this can can take just like a domino everything what, why do they why do they buy back the stock is that is everybody's that playing the, the game yeah because they show demand for the stock and they're hoping that they create the momentum that shows this growth that then it creates fomo within the investors so that they buy on and it's like it's like the crypto markets when you see when you see pumps yeah. they get momentum they get volume they get it going and then they allow the public to come and take over and ride that momentum to go there was a time it's where this was illegal actually it was illegal but now it now i think since only like a few years back it is now legal and now we see them do it but it was illegal for a reason because it's it's uh manipulation it's and, and so if and so i guess the concern then is if if they weren't to bail them out then the corporations would have to sell their stocks in order to pay employees or keep the business afloat. There would be negative feedback, the prices would go down. And then, uh, and then that company's stock would crash. And that's reflective of the S&P 500 and things of this nature. So it's all, it's all relative, right? If they allow these big companies to fail, then the public perception of the economy in the United States gets even more negative. So how they've tied everything together and the uh, mirage that they're trying to paint yeah. that it's not as bad as everybody thinks it might be that's like when you were saying earlier about the uh consumer index report um they they control what's put into that so when they have so much control over what is front facing then they use that to their advantage and one of the things that they want to do is prop up the s p 500 so it doesn't seem like as bad of a depression as it is and this is why they're focused on the major corporation and what what the corporation should have done during that time is if you look at the if you look at the pnl the profit and loss and the balance sheet usually you have earnings before taxes and then you pay the taxes and you have earnings after taxes that number should have been very high but what they did do is they took the earnings before taxes and then they instead of making a high earnings after taxes, put that into retained earnings yeah. for bad times, they reinvested, they collateralized the earnings before taxes to take on more loan, to expand more, to grow more. And um, usually if you should retain earnings um, in your balance sheet for bad times, but actually, even though they could have been extremely profitable, the official profit is only the earnings after taxes and the retained earnings. But if you reinvest a lot, that your earnings after taxes go to zero, your earnings before taxes go to zero, you pay no taxes and um, you can grow more. And that's the reason why um, why these companies, Starbucks and all of them, they are not even profitable. Okay. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. If you look, that it's no profits because they pay licenses to also, like to also the, also the franchise system and everything. They're not profitable. Yeah. Also salaries, I guess, are before taxes as well, right? So they're Yeah, but, but that's they're significant. They could have huge profits but the reinvestment is so high and, and all of these um, stock buybacks and they all go before the taxes. So in the end, the earnings after taxes and the return earnings and the balance sheet are extremely, extremely low. And they, of course, cannot um, retain these companies for many months in a big crisis. So I think, uh, you know, what's, what might be interesting here is to tell anyone watching, you know, how can they protect themselves about the events to come, you know, or, or not even protect themselves, but maybe how to how to profit off of what's to come. You know, I know a lot of people, not a lot of people, but some people made a lot of money in 2008 and nine years to follow. So, you know, we, we know that we're about to see a shit show. Uh, what do we, what do we, what is, what, do we, what does the average person do? Well, to, I mean, to protect yourself and prepare moving forward is for the majority of people to, s to stop doing what they've always done, which is over leveraging themselves. Um, be responsible, save your money for, for bad times. It's like when it's Warren Buffett, when everybody's fearful, you should be greedy. When everybody's greedy, you should be fearful. So it's human nature that when the economy and everything is going strong and 
like Carl said earlier, it's like keeping up with the Joneses. You see somebody buying a house and buying a car, so you want to keep up with them and buy a house and buy a car. That's the exact time you shouldn't buy a house and you shouldn't buy a car. You should be saving money for times like this because that's how people get rich and profit off of it. Is it's the people that have the savings right now that can dollar cost average into the decline. So you're not trying to time the bottom because that's almost impossible. But your dollar cost averaging on all your assets and your investments as we're going down. So when we go up, you're the one that, that really benefits from it. But it's it's stop buying when everyone else is buying. Do the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Save your money for these types of crises so you can survive at the very least. And at the very best, you can profit because you're buying when nobody else has the ability to. Yeah. I think also... Um the two things so for example you could go into assets which you cannot inflate as much as currency like gold silver or bitcoin and on top of that if you really want to take it very far and you have a very apocalyptic outlook into the future you should make sure that you have um like food supply and own garden where you can grow foods and all of that could be very helpful if things get really really bad just to make sure that you have some food and I'm, I'm not saying that it will go that far but um it okay. will let you sleep better if things go really crazy. You won't sleep better if you have too much toilet paper. So stop buying toilet paper <laughs> yeah. and buy some food. Yeah, just buy a bidet. <laughs> <and buy nuts. laughs> yeah. Carl, really? Yeah, I think that people that are sitting on massive amounts of debts now... I mean, personally, I just... I don't have debt. I, I don't, I'm not comfortable sitting with debt unless it's debt that is creating... Um, much more value for me than the interest I would be paying, but but I, I just I stay away from that. Um, but if you wanna if you wanna like have a safe haven and if you wanna diversify, I think that just holding gold, uh, silver, Bitcoin, and cash that would be uh, a great way of at least not losing money in the crisis. And if you're lucky, you will make a lot of money in the crisis. But what about, so this is kind of comes back to my question earlier, and like one of the arguments for Bitcoin is that it's a deflationary currency. Why? Because the, mo because the, the minting of it decreases over time, right? And so this is coming back to my earlier question of, right now, if the governments are printing more money, it seems to me like if the definition of Bitcoin was deflationary, then the, the definition of dollar would be inflationary, meaning that you get less for every dollar that you have. So, is it a good idea? I mean, and people we see right now with times of economic uncertainties in the markets, people are selling out their assets for their investments for cash. And then in our last panel, you said that you're only willing to keep as much cash as you're willing to lose, mm -hmm. right? So, is it a good idea to hedge in the cash in in the current market? Physical cash in the short term, yeah. Why not? Because people are. When people sell stocks, sell real estate, and sell whatever, they have to sell into something. And this something will be cash for at least some more time. But eventually, we all know that the, the central banks are printing so much cash that eventually the value of the cash will also just completely collapse. But I don't know how, that could take a long time. That could take another three, four, five years. I don't know. Um, but cash in the short term, in the crisis, I think, is... Um, <laughs> One of the two safe things. I don't think the, the insects in Thailand like cash too much. No. <laughs> They're objecting. Yeah. Um, and the system is still based on cash, right? You have to be able to spend money and survive. And uh, at this point, you know, it's difficult to spend Bitcoin on average day items, going to grocery stores, et cetera, et cetera. You can't walk in there with an ounce of gold and purchase stuff. So I think for where everything is right now, you do need some cash to survive. But it's probably more based out of necessity than optimism or future potential. Uh, it's the least opportunity to go up when you're talking about precious metals or Bitcoin or anything like that. It's only going to go down, like you said. Three yeah, but less, three physical cash, you said, that's, that's I think what we should be looking out for because if, if really bank runs start to happen, then um, yeah, yeah. it might be possible that if you have like big amounts of, ca of, of, of currency in your bank account, that you cannot even claim it anymore. So. That would be very important and also only in the immediate short term because if you see deflation, of course, holding cash is very good because you get more goods and services for the cash you hold. But whenever this turns into inflation or whenever this whole system even collapses and you are sitting on a bunch of cash that might be worthless or close yeah. to worthless. Yeah. 
they're already limiting withdrawals in the U.S. and banks. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing. I mean, this is going to happen more and more. Yeah. And since there's only maybe like 1% cash out there for all people, so if 100 people go to the bank, maybe just one of them or two, a top three people can get cash. So if, if we have a massive global bank run, then there could even be a huge premium on cash, where cash is very valuable because it's unobtainable. Uh, but it's only short term. This is not something that I would look for the long term. Long term, gold, silver, bitcoin. Yes. Because the fundamental problem of the current monetary system is that money is printable by a central authority, and gold and bitcoin is unprintable, and there is no central authority. So if the flaws of this current system is um, cash, then eventually people will have to sell this cash into some alternative. And I think, yeah, gold and bitcoin is perfect. So, so back to the, the topic of bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Uh, what is going to happen to the value of Bitcoin uh, in the time between now and uh, right before we see the financial markets collapse? What will happen to it when the financial markets collapse? And do you think that there's going to be a rally uh, at some point after the financial markets collapse? Like, like each, of, each of you just please answer this question. I think, opinion. first of all, if the financial markets collapse, um, like 50% or even 70% and Bitcoin stays at approximately $6,000 then Bitcoin essentially skyrocketed because it held its value against everything else so in nominal terms um, I'm not too sure because if we see a huge deflation then everything will deflate and everything will go, go down in value but the, the assets that go down less will essentially actually be going up yeah. in value against everything else. So, so proportional, right? Yeah, so if everything is falling, then you have to measure what is falling the least. Yeah. Um, so that's what's happening in the deflation. So, for example, gold could go down. Gold is currently at like $1,600. It could go down to $500 and still actually be in a massive bull run because everything else has deflated so heavily. And that's the thing in like a big super deflation that... that um, it, it will be hard to you, you cannot measure in nominal terms and even in a massive inflation it's also not good to measure in nominal terms because it looks like the stock markets are, are doing very well and and also in Venezuela it looks like the stock markets are the strongest in the world but it's it's just nominally if you look at the actual real terms value then um, it's completely disastrous mm -hmm. not, nothing to add on this point actually mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, me neither. I think I don't. I think it would be tough for anything to sustain in price with a seventy percent crash in say the the stock market. I think Bitcoin would likely go down in value, but I don't think it would go proportionally, and therefore it would be on the bull run as Carl described, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I would be shocked if anything maintained its value through what's about to happen. Um, but it's it's proportionally how does it kind of add up to everything else. And, and what kind of decontation. Yeah. So I guess uh, just to kind of wrap things up, uh, Chad, you weren't here for the last panel, but uh, we just did some wild speculation. And, and last panel we had was before uh, all of this started happening really bad with Corona. And, and uh, also, you know, the stock markets weren't so volatile as they were now. Um, so I guess I'm going to ask the same question. It's kind of fun. Um, but, but where do you guys see the price of Bitcoin at the end of 2020? Uh, you want me to start? Uh, sure. The end of 2020, like dollar value? Yeah. Throwing out a dollar value? Um, I'm going to say $5,000. Woo! This is low. <laughs> so I would, I would say... Because right now it's very hard to predict. Before it was much easier to predict, but with, if you have exogenous risks like um, the economy, a vi an unpredictable virus, um, monetary policy, and all of these exogenous risks also impacting the Bitcoin price in the short run, um, even though it will probably be a hedge against the fiat currency system in the long run, then it's very, very hard to predict. So I will give you a very broad range maybe. Um, starting at uh, 4k going up all the way to 14k um, really depending on on all the accidents with impacting the price um, in the mid run uh, 
Yeah, when it comes to these kinds of predictions, I feel like I'm just shooting in the dark. Um, I'd say 8,000. But that's not based on technicals, um, not even fundamentals really. I feel like all bets are off the table now, so I'm just gonna say 8k. And it's it's a, yeah, it's an absolute throw in the dark. We've never seen anything like this. If you would have asked me two months ago, I would have said thirty thousand dollars plus for Bitcoin. But this is there's no way to predict this. Nobody thought we would be here, and I think unfortunately, I, I think the worst is yet to come. Yeah. So uh, I guess the, to sum that up, that um, anyone who's uh, anyone who wishes that they would have gotten Bitcoin when it was twenty thousand, uh, you know, at that time, wish they would have gotten when it was cheaper. Uh, now is now is the time. Uh, you guys, are you guys um, bullish on Bitcoin long term? Yeah, I w what I would what I would like to say to those people, um, I can really understand it. It's just like the human psychology works. But think about you're going into a store, you see some like nice. Uh, Nike Yeezy, Yeezys for a thousand dollars and you think oh that's expensive let me think about it one night the next day you go into the store and it's six hundred dollars it's forty percent off or like it's four hundred dollars it's six hundred sixty percent off and you was considering buying it at a thousand dollars you might as well just buy it at four hundred dollars it's at the discount and Bitcoin is at a discount it's the same Nike Yeezys like the day before Bitcoin is the exact same like um, it was last year or like in the end of 2017 Fundamentally, nothing has changed. Bitcoin is still not inflatable. It's still a maximum supply of 21 million. The hash rate has been significantly going up since then. The fundamentals even have increased since then. So you have a very nice um, spread of fundamentals towards the price compared to the time before. So you might as well just buy the fear right now. Long term, extremely bullish. Uh, Bitcoin hasn't changed, as Chris just said. Uh, my advice would be for those people to, we were just talking about a dollar cost average. I think that's the most responsible, uh, most intelligent way to, to get in. Uh, the, it's difficult. We've all been there. I've bought currencies that went down after I bought them, and it's not fun to watch your investment shrink. So I think the best way to hedge and act responsibly, especially in these times which you've never seen before, is dollar cost average. Maybe you take ten dollars a month or a hundred dollars a month and buy a little bitcoin and you'll build your stack you'll get a nice average whether it goes up or down and i, I don't think you'll be upset but yeah still buy and it hasn't changed yeah i i i usually say that i think bitcoin is the best form of money in the world and that did not change the only thing that changed was the price and I still think that Bitcoin, in the in the equivalent of today's money, I think Bitcoin is still going to reach um, prices of five million dollars per Bitcoin, even higher as possible. Uh, and that that did not change. I still think that's possible based on the the current monetary, um, um, the value of all fiat money in the world, and the the value of all real estate and all of these other assets that people are using as a store of value. Um, and I think that when all of this deflates, then people are going to look for um, places to store their wealth. And uh, I think people sometimes forget about real estate, but there's like $200 trillion worth in, of real estate. And uh, nowadays people are really using real estate not to live in, but they're using it as uh, a investment vehicle. Store of value. Yeah, they're storing value in there because uh, if you store it in cash, you lose value over time. If you store it in real estate, you gain value over time. And people have been incentivized to, to speculate in this bubble. So when this deflates, then all these people are going to look for new places to store their wealth. And, and um, yeah, if you want no third-party risk, no default risk, then uh, Bitcoin and gold are both um, perfect. And I think... Bitcoin and gold are both going to take a lot of this value, so I think that. Um, uh, but Bitcoin has a bigger uh, potential of a, a bigger multiplier. Yeah, and you think risk to reward, and without those outside influences that you mentioned, like uh, defaults and things like this, when it comes to real estate, by gold and Bitcoin not being influenced and having the upside that they do, I mean the risk to reward ratio is just heavily in your favor. And the one thing I think everyone should remember is, you know, if Bitcoin is the best form of money, digital cash, cash, whatever, then the price today doesn't matter. You know, Carl said the only thing that's changed is the price. And price only matters when you sell, yeah. right? If your long-term vision is 100,000 of Bitcoin, 5 million per Bitcoin, 
it's going to be a road to get there. Whether that road is like this or that road is like this, it really doesn't matter as long as the destination is the same, right? And you sell when you when you reach that mark, whatever that goal is for you, 100,000, 5 million, whatever it may be. Or, or just, uh, yeah, or hopefully you come, you come to a world where you don't ever have to sell into Converge, but you just sell as you need to spend it. That would sure. be a deal. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's go ride some jet skis. <laughs> Come on, take a swim. <laughs> This looks so cute, man. Uh, <laughs> Rupert, say hi to the camera. Bye, 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 Bye,